very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm afraid we have a bit of a tech foul up um, going on here. So I'm going to try and do about two things at once, or possibly three, but hey, that's quite usual for me. So um, anyway, what I'm going to talk about today, obviously, is Twitter. Uh, we are hoping that I shall also be able to do live tweets, but if that doesn't work, one of my glamorous assistants will do that for me. Um, anyhow, so if you feel like tweeting along, um, the hashtag is either UCLDH or UCLDIS or both. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'd just like to um, give credit to my co-authors. Um, the, this is the, the UCLDH team, um, part of them at least. Uh, one of them is such a Twitter celebrity, she actually has her own hashtag. Um, but anyway, it's to thank, thank everyone for, for all their work on this, um, both on the research team and on the presentation. Okay, so what we're going to do here, or what I'm going to do, is make sure that all the slides are 140 characters in length. Um, and basically, I'm going to be using Twitter language as well. So if you don't like that idea, please leave now. Um, the point about this is that actually, I think there's a serious point to be made here. Um, there are different registers on the internet. There are different ways of speaking. Um, and there, you know, some of these have been thought to be, you know, is this lazy to be using language like this? Um, I don't think so. I think that there is a different type of language that we use and different registers that we use um, depending on what we're using uh, to communicate. Now, that doesn't just mean are we writing uh, prose on you know, something like a serious scholarly article or are we using the internet. There are different registers even on the internet now. So this is Twitter language. When I'm tweeting, I use a different type of language than when I'm emailing, than when I'm blogging. Um, and the point is that I think there is, as with the internet, so much changes. There is no sense now, I think, of authorial voice. I have lots of different voices when I'm on the internet. And I enjoy doing that, and I enjoy tweeting and using the language as it should be used. So um, I make no apologies for this. And this presentation, as I say, is going to be um, fully tweeted, as it were. Um, OK. Now, anyone here doesn't tweet? Wow. Gosh, I'm really surprised. And you've all come to a lecture about Twitter. Um, oh, no. I'm going to actually have to tell you about what it is. Um, I was hoping we could just, you know, skip over this bit. Um, OK, well, uh, we might have to go on to the next slide then. Um, Twitter, obviously, as you've gathered by now, is a medium in, it's called a microblogging medium, in which case, what it basically means is it allows people to express whatever happens that, to be on their mind for the, in, in the particular moment. No more than 140 characters, and that's because it, it was originally conceived of as, as a medium that would be used only on mobile phones. So that's the length of an SMS message. But now, of course, people tend to tweet from wherever, their mobile phones, their computers, wherever. But it does mean that um, you have to be particularly concise. So that it's developed its own kind of language, as you, as you will see. Um, and also, there are strange uh, kind of public, private things going on with Twitter, which is what I'm going to be talking about in a lot of this lecture. So um, there are certain conventions. If you want to reply to someone, but you don't mind everyone else seeing, uh, you use at. So if I want to reply to um, you know, someone, I would just say at, and then whatever your Twitter name is. Um, however, if I want to send a reply that's private, you send something called a DM. And that just, you just put D before your message. And that's more like an email. It's meant to be between you and them. If you want something to show up, so as I'm saying, if you want to tweet this and you want to, everyone in, the, in UCLDH, you want them to read about it, use the hashtag. And that basically says, so anything that I tweet that has the hashtag UCLDH will show up on the UCLDH Twitter stream. Um, also, you can RT, which means if you particularly like a message, you can resend it, as it were, under your name. But it includes the person's original name. So I found myself in the bizarre position a week or so ago on National Women's, International Women's Day of retweeting Kylie Minogue, <laughs> which I thought was rather exciting. He was also retweeting Annie Lennox. Um, you know, the thought that I might actually have been passing on something that Annie Lennox wrote, you know, I, I was a bit kind of interesting, shall we say. And this is what I mean about it breaks down these barriers between public 
public and private. Um, it's also those questions of how permanent is it? It's more permanent than speech. Um, and this this um, occasionally gets me into trouble um, in the sense that I talk about, oh yes, you know, so-and-so said such and such and such and such about her partner and I do occasionally say these kinds of things myself. And my husband says, this is terrible, you're telling the world about this, that and the other. And I said, oh relax, women have always said those kind of things about their husbands. The problem is on Twitter, it's there in for, the, for, the, for the world. I mean, only temporarily because once the tweets have come off your stream, they're not, they don't stay, stay there as with a blog unless you specifically archive them. But nevertheless, you know, there's this question about is this a permanent medium, is it an impermanent medium. In a sense, it's a bit of both. It makes things more permanent than speech, but it's less permanent than most digital text. So now we know a bit more about Twitter. And of course, this um, wonderful image is produced um, by our graduate student in UCLDH, Rudolf Amann, who is a designer extraordinaire and also designed our wonderful logo. Um, and this, the, this is the Twitter bird, because of course the birds tweets and so do we. Um, so if you're not a tweeter, that's, that's the, um, the point of that. Um, now, people have been talking about questions of online identity for a while. This is a classic of the early web. Um, you probably can't read the text, but it says on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And this appeared, it appeared in the, um, in the New Yorker in, I think, 1993. And it was people beginning to get to grips with this, what was this new internet medium? How can you, um, you know, literally, no one knows you're a dog. And for all we know, yeah, we'll come to this in a minute. Anyway, um, the, the point about this is, is this what we're talking about? Is digital identity, um, you know, what are we online? Who are we online? Are we the same person? I see the student union tweeted and said, are you the same person online and off? And I thought, oh, Lord, then am I going to have to talk about that anyway? We shall see. So um, there's that question of, this is what I'm really going to talk about. Who are we online? Um, or is digital identity this? You know, this is, um, often digital identity is discussed in terms of, how organizations um, or groups um, communicate their own selves online, their, their image, if you like. So this is our UCLDH website. This is extremely important as an issue, but it's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about individual identity. Um, wonderful as the website is, and it is wonderful. Um, so as I said, people have been talking about this for a while. People have been talking about this since the early days of the web when they suddenly decided that you could be a dog if you wanted. Um, the point about this is in the early days of the web, often a lot of the best stuff that's actually written about digital identity was written in the very early days of the web. Um, and people got very excited about the kind of utopian possibilities of the internet. And they were talking about things like, could you have, you know, there were questions about gender. If, you, if people don't know what gender you are, can you play with the co concepts of gender? Can you be someone else? Can you be a cyborg? So people were talking about cyborgs, and I think that probably comes from cybernetic organization, because people talked about cybernetics a lot in terms of robots. Um, and people talked about the questions of, can we have avatars? In other words, can we have a, a sort of online self that is different from us? It's a role we play if you like. Now, these days we are kind of cool with the idea that you have role-playing games. You can play um, multiplayer um, online role-playing games online, but you can also do other things. In the early days of the internet, people were thinking almost exclusively about how, what roles do we play online. And there was almost this idea that we will never be ourselves online because it liberates us from that. Um, I think what's interesting is that the concept of the avatar has been downgraded now, as we will see shortly, in that the whole idea of the avatar being this very complex being, this, you know, this creation of yourself. Now we talk about Twitter avatars, which are merely photographs, really, or are they, as I say, we'll see shortly. Um, so there was this question of, what are we doing here? Were we talking to machines? In the, in the early 90s, people were interested in this idea that um, artificial intelligence might talk back. Um, the machine might talk to us. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff to be said about that, which I don't have time for now. But um, I think now we have more of a sense that we're talking through machines. The, the machine is merely a communication medium, more like a phone, really. We wouldn't think of talking to our mobile phone. We think about talking through our mobile phone. I mean, I know it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But anyway, these, this, is, this is how, in a sense, things moved. And in the early days, people had this sense of offline and online are very, very different. You know, they're completely divorced from each other. Um, 
Now I think we have more of a sense that the two are, if you like, more normal. They're much more related. We have parts of ourselves. Um, and we don't feel that we're completely divorced from reality when we're online. Um, but there's also this question of what, what about real life? What is the relationship to real life? Uh, early, what were known as virtual communities, um, you know, in the sense of people getting together in online groups and discussing them, kind of imagined the idea that people would not see each other in real life, that they wouldn't have physical contact, that they probably didn't know each other until they met each other online. Uh, now, um, we tend to assume that we will know at least some of the people we talk to online. You know, I know quite a lot of my followers, and I will, you know, I expect that I'll meet quite a lot of other ones. And the title of this is taken from um, someone who I'd been tweeting to for months and months and months, uh, who's at the Office of uh, Digital Humanities in Washington. And uh, eventually we got to meet and, uh, you know, got on very well because you don't have to do all the preliminary stuff, you've already done it. And uh, he sent me an email afterwards, no, I think he sent me a tweet actually, and just said, oh, good to meet you IRL. Um, so the idea being, you know, we'd already met, but you have to meet IRL as well, and it's different. Um, so then we have some strange things about what do people actually do online on Twitter. There's this 99-1 um, rule, which suggests that most people simply read. Uh, some people will take part to a certain extent, and some people really, really take part and very actively post and very actively take part in conversation. And I think I would fall into the one, um, and probably quite a lot of us here would. Um, but what's strange is if you find out that Twitter is in a sense a public medium, it's a very much a public medium, it's absolutely public, you can find people's tweets on Google. And yet if you find out that someone actually doesn't, you can sign up to follow people, in other words you say, I am reading what you're producing and you identify yourself, and I identify myself to people I follow. If you find out somebody is reading what you've produced, but they know they're not actually following you, it feels weird. It feels like you're being stalked. And I have no idea why that is, except potentially that in the early internet there was this idea, and I'm a sort of ancient internet person as it were, that you know the internet was about openness, it was about telling people where you are and who you are. Okay, you might be telling them you were a dog, but you were still telling them. And I think therefore this, you know, these concepts of kind of firewalling things off and being secret online sit oddly, certainly, with um, geeks of my particular vintage, shall we say. Um, so, but what clues to identity do we have on Twitter, really? Um, unlike Facebook, which I imagine most people are on, you, in, on Facebook, you get a lot of clues about what people are. They tell you a lot about themselves in the profile. You see a lot of pictures. Sometimes you see more pictures than you really want to see. Um, and you, you get a, quite a, in a big profile of the person. The immediate, you know, immediately you see them. On Twitter, that's not the case. You get very little information in the profile, only 140 characters, obviously. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to think about in the rest of this lecture, how do we work out? How do we interpret people on Twitter? What do we say about ourselves? Um, so I'm going to show you some of our avatars, as I say, it's now rather a downgraded term, and talk about um, what they say about us and what, what, what we call ourselves online, our handles, if you like, say about ourselves. Um, so I've only obviously taken UCLDH people because I think that's only fair, really. Um, so we've got a couple here that they're telling us about what they do. This is the Dean of Engineering who calls himself Prof Serious, which is interesting because a lot of people use their own names as my colleague Anne Welsh does. Anne is a librarian, as you can see. Um, so, she's the, so they're both telling us about their professional lives. Um, the next one. This is about, this is what I work on. These are two graduate students at UCLDH. Rudolf, I've already mentioned, is our designer extraordinaire, and therefore you can see he defines himself by his design. Um, Ernesto was working on, well, still does work on web comics. He's a great tweeter. I don't know if he's here. I think he's probably at work. Then we have um, some, some rather less, um, people who are rather keen to tell you not, not so much about themselves. So uh, Leslie doesn't have a picture at all. This is the classic Twitter egg, which you have if you don't have a picture. And Julianne is much too much of a geek not to work out how to get her picture in focus. So she's quite deliberately telling us that, you know, she doesn't want you to see her um, too clearly. Um, on the other hand, 
Melissa, who's deputy director of UCL DH, is a digital native. As I say, she's such a DH celeb, she has her own hashtag. And um, basically what I see in this is that she's looking straight at the camera. It looks, and she looks completely cool and calm, and she's not bothered by it, and it looks very much like being on a webcam. Uh, we'll come to more about that later, however. Um, this is me, um, typically not looking at the camera. Um, <laughs> Um, this means, but this, this, is, this is the mixture of IRL and Twitter because this means something to me in real life. Uh, this was taken for the launch of the Centre for Digital Humanities, uh, so I know that it means something to me. Um, but it's also the, one of the very, very, very few digital pictures that are even half decent um, that I actually own um, because I hate having my picture taken, which is interesting. Both Claire um, Ross, who you saw drinking gin, and myself, I actually hate having pictures of us taken. But it never occurred to us not to use our own pictures in our av avatars, because we wanted to say, this is me. Don't like me particularly, but this is me. I mean, picture, obviously. Well, you know. Um, here, what's interesting also is that, that you saw some of, the, some of the handles. Some people using their real name. I use my initials because um, it saves characters, um, and some, but some people want to be very pseudonymous, which is kind of interesting because in early publishing, you know, print publishing, there was a lot of pseudonymous content, and it's almost as if some people want to do this because they're not really confident that this medium is all that um, safe, if you like, or all that prestigious. Um, but here are some nice um, pseudonyms that I, I like in particular. Um, Interestingly, a lot of these are librarians. Um, not just the first two and the last two are librarians. In fact, the last two are a couple of librarians. Um, and, and it's interesting. I don't know why librarians are so shy about telling us who they are. Um, but I also like, oh, no, not him again. And um, Paleo Futurist, who's a digital classicist. So basically, he's saying, I am a digital classicist in this. But he doesn't want to tell us about his name. So again, it's interesting. People are telling us a bit more about their roles, library mole. People are telling us about, I mean, for goodness sake, who knows what spherical fruit means? And I've only ever actually asked. Some, one of these days, I will ask her. Um, she's one of our library students. Um, but equally, then there is this question of almost like ventriloquism going on on Twitter. You can call yourselves orange aurochs, or you can tweet in the persona of someone else. So you really can be a dog or a cyborg, or you can be Big Ben, or there's a there's Trafalgar Square pigeon. Um, the Queen apparently tweets, although I doubt it's actually her. Um, and, and there are various other people who are, who are playing roles on Twitter. And, you know, there are dogs that tweet and horses that tweet and, um, and all sorts. So, you know, you've got this sense of people actively playing with this idea of, of identity. And I think this is very interesting because I don't know, I think it's an open question as to whether this is an assertion of your identity or an assertion of your identity as someone else. Or is it trying to kind of subvert control? Is it trying to say, I want to let go of the idea of who I am and I want to be someone else? And often, as I say, these someone else's are really quite, um, how should we put it, interesting. I mean, yes, the other day I got, I said something in, in sort of Jedi language and got, um, tweeted, got an at reply from Yoda. Right. OK, so it's that kind of thing, um, which I quite liked, actually. Um, so there's this question of what, what self are we on Twitter? Is it our public self? Is it our private self? Um, should we mix the two? Well, I actually almost wonder if we actually can separate them. Um, you know, what you were seeing there is people, in a sense, giving away quite a lot about their identity, whether they mean to or not. And almost the only way to stop doing that is being a pigeon or a dog or something. So what's clear, though, is that the other day someone tweeted and said, there are absolutely no rules for how to use Twitter. And I thought, yeah, great. I don't want there to be rules. The whole point about this is me being an ancient geek again. You know, there shouldn't be rules. You should express yourself as you wish to express yourself online. And indeed, you know, when Sherry Turkle's talking about the early internet, she's talking about people having different personas. And she is a psychologist. And talking about, actually, if you try and wall off your different selves, if you describe that in a clinical case, people would say that was a sign of being a psychopath because it's about you know, multiple personality disorder. So what's happening you know, since then? That's 1993. You know, we're, we're changing our views quite definitely here. Um, so there is the case of should we, you know, should we try and separate our work life and our private life? Um, 
Some commentators have actually suggested there's something lost if we do, that if we don't, even if we're tweeting in a, tw tweeting, tweeting in a professional capacity, if we don't give something of ourselves, it seems flat. It seems unconvincing. You don't get the sense of personality. Um, and certainly we found that even though we know that everyone is in public, a lot of, um, a lot of you know, people like grad students have found that in tweeting even just as themselves, being perfectly honest about their kind of public and private things, has often made their reputation. And when they come to you know, go interviewing for academic jobs or something, people will say, oh, yes, we've, you know, we've seen what you produce on Twitter. And in almost every case, that's been a positive experience. Um, there's another interesting question, which is this idea about at replies and links. Um, a lot of, when you, as I say, when you're replying to someone, you tend to use at. Um, of course, you don't have to reply to someone. You can simply tweet and include a web link in there. Now, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, oh, no, no, you don't want to put at replies in. It's a bit girly and pathetic. Um, you know, you actually want to tell people about what you know. And telling people about what you know is putting lots of links in. So you shouldn't be just chattering to people. You should be telling people stuff. And I found this very interesting because classically, um, linguistic studies of language and gender talk about the way that women are socialized to communicate and to create connection and to create community, whereas men are socialized more to create hierarchy and to make themselves look important. So now there hasn't been a study of whether there is a gendered correlation between at replies and links, but please no one do it because I think that's our next project. <laughs> um, so, you know, there is this real question of, in the old days, these things used to be called virtual communities. Now they tend to be called social networks. I actually prefer the virtual community term, but I think it depends whether you construct the verb to network as what I've just been talking about in creating connections and communicating or working the room. And again, I think that maybe there may be gender differences there. But again, I can't tell you because we haven't done the study yet. <laughs> Only occurred to me while I was writing this. Um, just to finish off uh, a kind of interesting study of something that happened in my own discipline where it's all very well at replying and talking to your friends, but people who don't, you know, it's very easy then to construct yourself as a clique by accident. And there was a kind of rather a spat at this year's MLA where people new to the discipline were saying, all these cool kids on Twitter, they just talk to each other. There's this star system in DH. They don't care about the rest of us. They're an elite. They talk to each other on Twitter. And we were kind of go, you must be insane. DH is the most open discipline in the entire universe. You know, of course we don't. But then we thought about it and we thought, actually, yeah. And in fact, the study that we've done at, at UCL DH does suggest that in conferences, most people, if they're using this as a back channel, are talking to people they already know. And the other day, I mean, I haven't got a huge follower list or anything, but the other day someone at replied to me who I didn't know. And I was a bit taken aback. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I started thinking, well, why is that? Why would it be a problem for somebody I don't know IRL to get in touch with me? And it almost seemed rude. It almost seemed to presume, you know, an acquaintance, which, which is interesting. So we almost by accident, we can create these kind of in-groups. So to finish, um, I think it's important that we remember that digital humanities is about applying the humanities to think th things digital as well as the other way around. So I think what I've been trying to do today is use that kind of humanities methodology to interrogate something digital. And I think if we, if we use the kind of critical methodology here, as in literary critical methodology, I think in some ways, when I was saying there aren't many clues to identity that you get immediately on Twitter, but you build up a picture gradually. And I think it's almost like tweets, as in people on Twitter, become characters, as in a literary text. You find out about them gradually. You get little bits of information about them gradually. You find out what they say to other people. You find out about their relationship to other characters, if you like. So to the extent, looking at Twitter over time is like reading a novel or like watching a play. It's like, in a sense, interpreting a literary text. The logic of that, therefore, is that, sorry to those people who know their critical theory, but in a sense, when you let go of your tweets, you cease to be in control of your identity. You are, not, you are the author, but you don't have any more power over them. So in a sense, who we are on Twitter depends on how we are read, how we are interpreted, how our text is interpreted. And so I think the thing I would stop 
the point I would stop on is that we can construct the avatars, as I showed you earlier, but we can't control our identity because our identity is about how we are perceived and read as much as what we create. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Claire, for an absolutely fascinating talk. We do have time for some questions. If you do have a question, um, this lecture is being filmed for uh, online, so if you could wait for a microphone to reach you, that would be great. There's one up by you. So. Hi, thank you, Claire. Um, in a sense, there's always been this interest in the difference between the author from the page and the author IRL, as I learned today, whether it's a, a novelist or even a, a diarist, it would seem to be very close your diary to who you actually are, but in fact there can be a very interesting difference between those two persona. Is there anything distinctive about a digital environment, do you think, that makes it that whole discourse about those differences between the written person and the actual person different to say just a continuation of that tradition of, of analyzing that very fact? Is there something about writing digitally or the interface with electronic media which puts that whole discussion on a, on a new level? I think if, if somebody had been giving this kind of lecture early in the early 90s, they would have said, yes, there is. And they would have said the digital medium does change things. I think now I would agree more with your original idea that actually there's a continuum. You know, most of what we learn about the, the relationship between digital and physical uh, in all, all sorts of ways um, underscores this idea that one, the digital doesn't, doesn't replace the physical. It it carries on the continuum in a, in a sense that, so we, we can't divorce what is happening in the digital sphere from, from what has happened. So I think, yeah, you know, I think there's always, as you said, there's always been the uh, wish of people to talk about their lives um, and the question of how honest are they actually being. Um, and we find that in all kinds of online media. So I think it probably talks more about the, the sense of how we present ourselves in words that are written probably more than the question of whether those words are written digitally or physically. Although, as I say, there is something rather interesting in Twitter about the question of how, how permanent or Im impermanent are those words. And I think that might be the difference, that there is this curious question of it's not totally ephemeral, but at the same time, it's not permanent either. So I think that may, may be the difference. Hi, I was wondering, um, what uh, was your reaction to the idea in the discourse of the Twitter revolutions in terms of what was going on in Northern Africa and Twitter's contribution for good or for bad mm. within yeah, that. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about that because there's been so much about that in the media. But, but yes, I mean, it is very interesting that, that Twitter, like blogging, you know, Twitter is rightly called a microblogging medium because like blogging has been doing this for quite a long time, that bloggers have been able to get information out that cannot be printed in the mainstream media for reasons of editing and, you know, political bias of newspapers and things like that. And Twitter has a very similar function. And it was interesting that we went to a seminar at CASA recently, um, and they were looking at the frequency of tweets in different places. And you could see that people were still managing to tweet in Cairo, even when the internet had been turned off. You know, so they were doing it through their phones and 3G. So I think, yes, you know, there, there is a... If, but if you like, again, this is not necessarily to do with the medium. This is to do with... Um, the kind of desire of people to get information out if they can. So, you know, the idea of having Samizdat and having access to photocopiers in the former Soviet Union so you could get things out. And, of course, in the CIA producing photocopiers for people to do this. So it's, I think the technology changes, and it, it makes it easier for people to get those stuff, those things out. But it, it's, not, it's not a new phenomenon, if you like. Um. About like the app replies and the links and the broadcasting communication, do you not think that if you just broadcast links all the time, like in a masculine way, you're kind of ignoring the whole point of Twitter to be this massive global com communication? Yeah, totally. But then you're female. <laughs> but, I also, uh, but I also work on Twitter, so and we have as an organisation, we're trying to be less link heavy yeah. because we've realised that to get that one percent 
uh, the 1991 mm. to actually read and do something with it. You have to ask the questions, you have to reply to actually engage the audience mm. in the first place. Mm. No, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of businesses miss huge opportunities because business tweeting or organisational tweeting tends often to be one way, it tends to be broadcast because they don't have the person power to do the two-way stuff. And it's a really missed opportunity, as you say, because when Twitter works best is often when someone tweets, someone replies, and something happens as a result because people feel that there is attention on them. So yeah, I fundamentally disagree with this idea that to be macho and business-like, you only have to have at replies. I think it's, but I do think, you know, the interesting thing is perhaps that a lot of organizations are missing this opportunity. And, you know, there are not a lot of organizations with very senior women in them. There, you might say there might be a correlation there, you might say there wouldn't. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's something that I think needs to be unpacked a lot more. There's one right at the front here. Hi, I was just wondering to what extent you think people are completely constructing their public image in order for professional gain or acknowledgement? <laughs> Some people, I mean, it depends, you know, it depends on the people, really. I mean, in, you know, some people are very definite about you have to construct a public persona. If you're going to tweet professionally, you have to have a persona and you must not step out of it. Um, I am of the other opinion, and we occasionally have discussions about this on Twitter with some of my friends, one of my friends who says, if they disagree with me tweeting about being on the allotment, they can just unfollow me. You know, and he does tweet about his, um, he does tweet about, you know, his professional life, but he tweets about, you know, what he's growing on his allotment. And I think it's a different point of view. I think some people feel that, you know, it, that's unprofessional and you have to control your image absolutely. Um, but as I say, there are other commentators on Twitter who say, if you do that, you lose. If you do that, people see, they, 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 don't, they don't feel a connection with you and therefore they don't feel a connection with the organisation because you're too perfect. You know, you have, most people when they're at work will eventually chatter on about, you know, their partner, their kids, their dog, their horse, their whatever it might be. And, and you know, that's, in a sense, that's the behaviour we're used to. So if we don't see it online, you know, there's almost a sense of this feels a bit wrong, it feels a bit fake. So I think, you know, some people do do it, and some people are absolutely adamant that you must do it. I don't believe it, frankly. Any more questions? There's one, there's one behind you. Um, I run a, a, a Twitter chat over a hashtag, um, and it was kind of interesting you said about lurkers, because we've got like 1,500 followers, but yet, I don't know, about 50 people participate. And I was just wondering if there's like any kind of um, advice you could give to kind of get them to participate in a kind of, you know, play on their mind or something, so they kind of think about it. <laughs> it's just classic behaviour. In every, every CMC study there's ever been, what used to be called CMC, computer-mediated communication way back in the Jurassic, I mean, everyone's always known that virtually most people lurk. You know, most people just don't want to join in. And those that join in, you know, you will have some people that really get into it, some people that do a little bit. But, you know, actually, your ratio you've got there, I can't do the maths in my head right now, but the ratio you've got there suggests to me that that's, you're actually doing better than the, than the norm. And I, I, I think you, you have to accept that a lot of people just like to lurk. You know, they, they just like to hear what's going on. And, but it's interesting, it's a pejorative term. I mean, that lurking comes from the early days of internet lists and Usenet groups and stuff. And there is this kind of pejorative connotation as if you, are, if you are part of this, you should take part of this. And I kind of agree with that myself, but that, as I say, maybe because I'm this ancient internet person and I just can't get out of that mindset. <laughs> I just wondered um, what you think about who we are when we're on Facebook and whether that is different from who we are when we're on Twitter. I mean, you, you talked about how much more data there's there, but are we in some sense, you know, both those things? We tend to be on both? That would be difficult for me to answer because I don't Facebook. Ah, okay. I have a Facebook account, but I got bored of it after a few people asked me to be pirates. And, and zombies <laughs> and things. And I kind of went, and the point of this is, I stopped pretending to be a pirate when I was about 10. Um, so, I know, but seriously, um, I think there, is, there was a wonderful thing that someone tweeted recently, which is, Twitter is, where, let me get this right, Facebook is where you lie to your friends, and Twitter is where you're honest to everyone. <laughs> um, and I actually think that might be right. So I think, in a sense, the, um, you know, the boundedness of, of the medium and the unboundedness of the medium may be what's different. But it's interesting, I can't quite put my finger on why Facebook just doesn't attract me. Whereas I love Twitter, and it may just be because I like the language. I like the need to be brief. I like the, the, the kind of 
the challenge of getting everything to be witty in 140 characters. And I like, you know, I, I just like that, you know, occasionally sort of something comes out of your head and onto the screen. And that, Facebook just doesn't give me that. So I couldn't really go into much detail, but there's got to be something there because there's got to be some reason why I like one medium and not the other. Are there any final questions? There's one right behind you, Zoe. Hello. Uh, would you have any comments regarding when uh, someone speaks more than one language and you have followers that only speak either English or Spanish? How does that relate to your identity or... Uh, that's really interesting. I can't answer that, to be honest, because I'm not bilingual myself. I do have one or two followers who are bilingual, and one of them is actually in Mexico, so sadly she can't comment. Um, someone tweet Isabel quick. Um, I, don't I don't think we have time, unfortunately. If we'd, we'd had this as the first question, we might have got a tweet reply back. But no, seriously, it's a very, very good question. You know, I, I do find that when I speak other, another language, I feel like I'm a different person, but I don't tweet in it very often, just occasionally. Um, and so I, th I think that's a study that needs doing, and I think one of my students is thinking she might want to do it or she might want to go into that a bit, but that, you know, that's a very interesting research topic of its own, I think. Okay, I think that is all the questions we have time for. Just before we finish, um, those of you who missed the 1st of February lecture, um, would you give your right arm to save your heart, which was interrupted by a fire alarm, that's being rerun this Thursday, so I hope you can make that. Um, so all that remains me to say is thank you very much for coming for your questions, and also to Claire Warwick for her lecture. <laughs>